I'll give a little introduction to myself. So I, I first uh, met Carlo um, last two years ago. We were running a very similar conference in Cape Town, and uh, he came and approached me about hosting a gift workshop in South Africa. And one of the important things that we have in South Africa is the need to bring school teachers into these very large uh, workshops and conferences. So they, they get to sort of rub shoulders with um, international sort of superstars in their sciences, and they start to sort of break down the differences between um, university, very sort of high-profile academic work with sort of just a general overview that is needed for schools, um, particularly in the education of, of young scholars. Uh, what I found very important for GIFT and what I presented last year was how in South Africa we're trying to really link in the uh, training experiences um, of, of teachers and also school children that they actually not only learn about, let's say, the oceanography or uh, marine geology, but they also have that experience by going to sea. And so we run a floating university where we take um, many... Um, uh, students from all the universities in South Africa, we have about 25 universities, we take a few school teachers as well, um, and we bring in the theoretical classroom knowledge with the hands-on experience where they spend about four to five hours every day working on the ship, getting the samples and breaking down that sort of the, the um, experience of gaining the information and also learning the theory behind it. So when I had a, a plan for a meeting to come to EGU, I immediately emailed Carlo and asked him if I could give some kind of pre presentation. Um, I am an oceanographer. I'm not a marine um, geologist. Um, but I, I felt to link into GIFT, it was important to talk a little bit about the oceans, where we've come from, but I guess more importantly where we're going. Um, not that we will see it ourselves in our lifetime, but in the next 250 million years, I, I hope to give a, a, a glimmer of where we will be, providing this all works. Is this, is this working now? Okay. All right. So, uh, well, originally this is where we were many, many millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. It's something that you're familiar with. And you can see where Antarctica... Um, I'm just seeing, does this have the, yes, here is Antarctica, we have Africa here, South America, this is sort of India, and there's Australia, and if you look at fossils, or you look at the movement of our dinosaurs, if you look at rock um, formations, there are very strong similarities across many of these continents. We have a lot of researchers in South Africa that are working in Mozambique along this side, the east coast of uh, Southern Africa, and they're identifying the same rocks in Mozambique that they are now in Antarctica. So that just creates you know, more confirmation of where we were millions of years ago during Pangaea and Gondwana land phases. Um, okay. So my um, talk really is just to talk about shaping the Earth uh, from Pangaea and uh, you know, over 230 million years ago and possibly back. And really, what is the role of the oceans? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the shape of the ocean basins, how we got there, and how scientists are able to provide better understanding of how the oceans are moving and at what rate. Because none of the oceans are spreading at the same rate. And of course, that is helping us change the way the continents are formed, where they lie, uh, how they are moving. Um, and what you'll see is that some oceans, particularly the Pacific Ocean, is spreading at a much faster rate than something like the Atlantic. And what we have is a cycle of events that is basically formation all the way to destruction of our ocean basins. And then um, finally, I want to just give you some evidence that while well, in Britain, I've just come from the UK, Everybody is crazy about Brexit. Well, my very last slide shows you that Brexit is, if, if we can believe our, our models that are interpreting the, uh, the, the rates of ocean basin formation and spread, if you can believe that the models are relatively realistic, and you know, one is always a little bit cautious with, with uh, models because they rely on very good data being pumped in, but also uh, it's very important that when you're looking at projecting 250 million years' time, uh, we can't be 100% certain. But uh, my very last slide shows you that Brexit, I think, is here to stay, right up to 250 million years. 
Okay, so this is a slide that I show most of my students and, and they look at this and they have really no idea what they're seeing. Um, it's really the, the seafloor and what you see very clearly is that you have a, a very extensive mountain chain. This is your mid-ocean ridge. It stretches all the way down from uh, India, all the way down to uh, Antarctica, all the way right up a, 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 along the Pacific. We have the Ring of Fire that I'll talk about in a moment. We have another mid-ocean ridge all the way down to Antarctica in the Atlantic. And so we have this connection. Um, and these ridges are where we have new formation of rock, but also where we have a lot of movement going on, a lot of um, changes happening because of these ridge systems. What we have in red are really our continental regions, our shelf zones, which are about 200 meters in depth. A lot of our fisheries are based there. We look at these regions as large um, areas where we get a lot of our resources, our gas, our oil, minerals. And then in between we have the sort of very steep continental shelf region um, where it sort of steps right down into the deep oceans. And what you see from the purple is that these are large areas. It's predominantly the majority of the oceans are over 4,000 meters in depth, over four kilometers in depth. So if you take your car and you drive four kilometers, that's sort of in your mind uh, the average depth of the oceans. And uh, th these are the abyssal plains. They're very flat. They're sort of relatively boring. We know very little about them just because of their depth. It's difficult to do sort of deep ocean research uh, extending down into these layers. Or, and it's also very time consuming. So this just gives you a very good idea of the sort of the ocean basin and of course the, the shape of the continents as we are today. Uh, this is not the best photo. I, I, I looked for something that was a little bit clearer, but I put this in. What we have here is, here is America, there's New York and Boston. We have down here Cuba, and obviously to the right would be Europe. But I wanted to put this in because it highlights the complexity of the sea floor. If we imagine what the uh, planet looks like, and we take a drive to the Alps because we're in Austria, or... I always talk about a Table Mountain in Cape Town, this sort of big drop down into the city bowl. <coughs> if you can imagine what that looks like on land, essentially it's the same down in the deep oceans. We just can't see it, and it's very difficult to, to measure and to monitor effectively. But we have exactly the same. We have these large, rich areas. We have large transform fractures where there's a lot of activity going on, and I'll come to that in a moment. We have all the islands and seamounts dotted all the way. They, they're sort of moving away from our ridge systems. And we have that very steep um, drop down into the deep ocean. And here is the flat area um, of our continental shelves. And if we go back in time and we look at sort of the last glacial maximum, we had a lot of changes in our uh, coastline where much of this area was either um, exposed or, or substantially reduced in, in size. Sorry, I've just I've come from uh, South Africa with a bit of flu. Um, so if we just take a, a line across from North America to Europe, oh great, thank you. Um, what you see, if you take a walk along, you have exactly that, whoops, sorry, you have exactly that. You see how you go from, let's say, near Halifax all the way to, um, uh, thank you very much, all the way to West Africa, you can see how the ocean moves down from the continental margin, drops down significantly to the abyssal plain regions, and then it sort of moves along up into the mid-ocean ridge system. So this would be like sort of crossing the Alps, back down into the abyssal area, and then back up to the continental margins. And you see that in all the ocean basins because they all have this mid-ocean ridge. And they all have these large, deep ocean basins on either side of the ridge. And this is what is interesting for an oceanographer, is what is the rate of formation across this ocean basin? And is uh, North America spreading further away from Africa, or is it getting closer? And to understand that, one needs to look a little bit at the construction areas and the destruction areas of the world's oceans and where that happens because the oceans can expand to a certain point, but the world is not going to change its size. So while there might be some expansion, there inevitably is some form of destruction elsewhere. Um, I just show this as a slide. This is a slide I showed to my students, and it's just to, 
to remind them how deep uh, the oceans actually are. And what I have here is elevation of land. And you can see that the majority of our land masses lie below 1,000 meters. And that makes sense. We see that. We live on land, so we, we experience that. But if we go into the deep ocean, we always think that the, the beautiful coastline and the beautiful ocean and uh, coastal seas that we swim in, that is what we see and what we experience. But the deep world is really, it's literally a world away. We have a very large part of our ocean which sits between four and 5,000 meters in depth. And that makes uh, research in these areas relatively um, expensive, or very expensive, um, and extremely time consuming to get down into these uh, deep, deep parts of the oceans. So this just gives you a, sort of an overview of, of how the ocean depth varies um, across, across the Earth's percentage uh, surface. The oceans are a very mysterious place, and they're, they're I'll just take some of this. And these photos just show you some examples of the ocean floor. Um, we have, uh, and you'll be aware of this, the sort of the black smokers, which is part of the mid-ocean ridge where new crust, oceanic crust is forming. We have sort of the traverse faults and the sort of the bit large fracture zones and the deep trench systems that extend right down to 10,000 meters. The Mariana Trench in the um, Pacific Ocean is the deepest part of the world's ocean, extending to nearly 11,000 meters. We have these beautiful formations as part of this sort of mid-ocean ridge system and lots of sort of crumbling rock uh, that you see in the area. If we look at the life that lives down there, we have wonderful creatures that live there. They're very sort of weird, weird and quite, um, yeah, quite disturbing to look at. But they have to exist in, in a very dark zone. There is no light obviously down in the deep ocean, and they exist through the sort of lantern um, where they create, able to create their own um, lighting system. Obviously large teeth to be able to attract and, and haul in predators. They create their own sort of bioluminescence and obviously big eyes in a, a world that has very little light and life uh, down there. <coughs> So just to sort of um, recap on what I've said, we have a, an ocean basin that stretches obviously from one continent to the next. We have a, a fracture region known as the Mid-Ocean Ridge that lies um, in the middle and on either side is the abyssal plains. We have the continental shelves that are relatively shallow but stretch right down into the, the deep ocean through the continental slopes. If we go to one side of the ocean basin, we tend to have a trench system where we have the destruction of a lot of the um, ocean uh, or oceanic um, crust that is, that is being formed by the ridge system. So essentially we have a sort of a push and pull situation with construction formed in one area, destruction in another. So how do the ocean basins form and, and how long has it taken? Well, we know from Pangaea and from Gondwana 250 million years ago that, that it's taken that long to move the, the continents from one region to another, for Antarctica to separate from uh, South Africa, for Australia to move away, and for India to move right up into the northern hemisphere and create the Himalayas. So we know that it moves at a relatively slow pace, and I'll come to that in a moment. This is essentially a very simple diagram. I use that because it's a very nice way to explain how the ocean is formed and how long it takes. And when I come to the Wilson cycle, it's a breakdown of where we are or where the oceans are in relation to that cycle. We move from an embryonic stage where we have just sort of the upliftment and sort of the molten lava moving up through fissures um, in the uh, continental plate, sort of cracks and formations that allow this sort of, through their weaknesses, allow the sort of lava to pop up. And over time, we, we have the movement as these plates are moving very slowly apart. The Rift Valley, as an example, the uh, Rift Valley in East Africa, is an example of a, a new sort of a juvenile or embryonic stage in ocean basin formation. We have the development of the sort of the linear sea, where we have the mid-ocean ridge gradually forming and pulling the plates further apart. And of course, we have the full-blown ocean basin where we have the difference in the oceanic crust, which is very dense, 
uh, very rich in sort of your uh, basalt minerals, and the continental crust, which is lighter in its density and composed more of your aluminium and your silica uh, rocks. But as I said, there, is, there has to be this destruction. And so what we see on the trench systems, uh, we have a, an area where our oceanic crust, because it's a difference in density, is starting to subduct below, uh, particularly at the subduction zones, which we, we, have, uh, we label as ocean trenches. And they subduct down and break when they get into the asthenosphere. And this is the Benioff zone where they break apart and create a lot of devastation. And if you start looking at where the major earthquakes are, where we have a lot of volcanic activity, it's always linked to these areas where we're starting to see oceanic crust moving or being destroyed or being formed at the mid-ocean ridges. So this is, again, just a map of the ocean floor. And what I want to highlight is these are the major large earthquakes that have formed um, in the last, let's say, 100 years. And uh, what we see is that they really are stretched right along the areas where we have the subduction belt, our major trench ocean systems. So we have the trenches along Peru. We have a, a trench running right along the marina trench lies just off Japan, stretching all the way down. Indonesia has a major trench system, and then obviously down into close to Antarctica. <coughs> Other major earthquakes occur where we have the formation um, along the rift, um, the, the ridge systems in the middle of the ocean. If we look at sort of a major, uh, highly destructive uh, earthquake systems, again, you can see that there is a strong um, link to the formation sites and the destruction sites of oceanic and um, crustal regions. And so what we're starting to realize is that the formation of the oceans is a very destructive, it's a very um, challenging environment. It's a volatile uh, and very dynamic environment. And it's very hard to sort of know what is, what is happening at the mid-ocean ridges just because it's very difficult for us to go to sea and to monitor. It's extremely expensive to have a ship on station um, doing endless monitoring of particular regions. There's a, there's a great deal of interest on mid-ocean ridges and a great deal of marine geological interest in pulling out uh, many of the rocks, trying to understand and date uh, the ocean um, region and try to identify the spreading rates of that region. So as an example of where we see um, evidence of um, new islands forming as part of this uh, mid-ocean ridge um, construction area, here's an example of Surtsey Island. This was formed uh, in the early 1960s. It was observed first by seamen um, working in the area, and they just observed a large area of steam and molten rock basically bubbling up to the surface. It's an area just sort of south here in the south uh, North Atlantic region, and it was a, an example of basically the, the forces that are being formed at the mid-ocean ridge system. If we see their formation, they tend to be formed at the mid-ocean ridge, and then over millions of years, they gradually move out, forming these sort of flat-top guyots, but they move away as the oceanic crust is moving outwards from this ridge system, and they gradually move, move out up to sort of 100 or up to 1,000 kilometers away from the central region. If I look here, this is an example of the Tristan da Cunha. Tristan da Cunha is an island that sits in the South Atlantic and lies um, just uh, about 200 uh, nautical miles off the central point of the mid-ocean ridge. It's a British island, and there are about 300 people that live um, on this island. It's a very, very interesting place to visit, but it's a good example of these islands that are formed as a result of the um, construction occurring and the, sort of the uh, development or the formation of new oceanic crust formed um, at these regions. Okay, I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on time, so... Okay, but how can we date the floor? We understand that, that the ocean floor is moving all the time and we understand that we have new formation sites all the time occurring at these regions. We also have destruction of the site, so there must be some difference in the way that the oceans are, are moving. There must be changes. Some areas must be forming crusts much faster than others, 
And we also have the destruction regions along the trench systems that obviously have different rates in which they are being destroyed. So how do oceanographers or marine geologists actually get to date the ocean? And it's a, it's a relatively simple process, but we have this movie. It's, it's not the best one. I tried to find a slightly better one that shows uh, the striations. But what we have when molten lava pops up to the surface on the ridge systems, it is able, through the mineral structure of the lava, create or capture the um, geomagnetic polarity at the time of its formation. And we're in a, in a world where we have a reversing um, polarity. If you take your compass and you look at where you have true north and magnetic north, there's always some deviation. Um, I, over years, spent many years sailing, and I never really understood why every year there was always a slight change in the position of magnetic north. And it's just because we have a, a magnetic field that is constantly in motion. It's always moving, and we have shifts between normal, normal polarity when our geo geomagnetic north pole points northwards, or it may deviate from the north, and we have a reverse polarity when that magnetic pole has shifted southwards. And so our true north might be sitting over the Arctic, but our um, geomagnetic um, north pole actually sits closer to the Antarctic region. And this sort of flip-flop is something that is basically captured by the formation of, of the new oceanic crust at the mid-ocean ridge. And so when we start looking at the formation sites, we can start picking up these sort of striations resulting to the change in polarity over thousands of years of time. So what we start to see is that where we have the formation of new crust here, we have a normal polarity where our um, north magnetic north pole is, is aimed at, uh, at the north pole. And then when we have a reversal, what we see is that the south pole is... Uh, the magnetic South Pole is, is flipped over to the northern side. And so this flips over and over from time to time. And if we just give examples, uh, regions where we have seen a lot of activity, particularly you know, examples of Surtsey Island, what we see is over millions of years how this moves back and forward. And we get these wonderful striations that are able to allow us to actually date the ocean floor. And by dating the ocean floor, we can then start determining the spread rate from the region of formation out into the deeper ocean basins. So we have model simulations that reveal that compasses could change again in the next thousands of years. We don't really understand why this is happening. There are many um, theories out there. I'm, I'm not a geologist, so perhaps I'm missing one, one or two theories, but there's obviously the instability of the magnetic field. We have a chaotic nature within the Earth's uh, central core. Very thick molten lava in the center has a very different rotation to the world's uh, general rotation of the planet. And there is possible links to the solar magnetic field and the, the differences that we see, the variations um, over time that we see in this. And scientists have revealed that the Earth's liquid core is rotating slower than in previous years, and there is some suggestion that may also influence the, the reversals in our magnetic field. So this was the Wilson cycle that I spoke about, and this helps us now understand how we are moving from an embryonic stage where we have a gradual upliftment and a break and a, a fracture in the um, continental uh, crustal regions to juvenile, all the way through down to suturing, terminal and suturing, where we have gradual destruction. And what we've listed here is not just the motion, but what I want you to focus on are the examples um, in the world. So the East Africa Rift Valley essentially is where we are starting to see that embryonic, that gradual pull of our ocean, um, our Rift Valley, possibly in millions of years to come, creating a new ocean environment. We have the juvenile stage, which is the Red Sea. We're very familiar with that. And then as you move down, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, Pacific, Mediterranean, and Himalayas, obviously, is where India moved up towards the um, Southeast Asian continent. So this uh, um, image just gives you the age of the oceanic sea floor. Um, it's a very nice image because it highlights exactly where we have the formation sites, what we see here in the central are our mid-ocean ridges. There's the Atlantic one, we have the Indian Ocean, 
and also the Pacific. And you can see that this is all creating new rocks all the time. The lithosphere here is relatively young. As you move further out into these ages, you can see by the color bar how that is starting to uh, date over time. And we move right up into sort of 160, 280 million years um, that that <coughs> rock was first formed. If we look at the spreading rate, and we look at sort of getting an idea of how the oceans are responding to this and how they are moving apart, what we start to see is that the spreading rate appears to be at its greatest in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if you go to the Atlantic, while you do have formation and you do have destruction, that rate is substantially less than in other regions. Here we have just off Madagascar, we have um, a, a slightly higher spreading rate than in other regions. And so what we're starting to see is that our world is going to change over millions of years, and we're going to see certain ocean basins being essentially closing up as their spreading rates are a lot slower than other regions, and certain areas like the Pacific overtaking these large, um, these other ocean basins. And so I'm just going to end on two more slides. This one is one of the future world in 150 million years' time, and what it shows very nicely is that we're starting to see that the um, regions, Africa, Eurasia, are starting to move together. What we see is that England is essentially still an outpost there in the north. And we start to see that there is gradual movement. Australia, Antarctica are all starting to move together. And in my very last slide, this is uh, what the models show in 250 million years' time, where we could be. Um, if we believe and our observations show that the Pacific is spreading at the rate that it is, then our model outputs suggest that the Pacific Ocean will be the dominant ocean, or well, it will continue to be the dominant ocean, um, and it will basically push all the continents back together again, creating a one single sort of inland sea, which is the Indian Ocean, which is being pulled nor further northwards and also being closed in by South America, Australia and Antarctica remaining a little bit further to the south. But it's a long way away. It's something that we don't um, need to worry about at the moment. It's something that a lot of oceanographers, marine geologists, are focusing heavily on to try and just understand um, the, the information that's coming out from the oceans. I think the most important thing to get across is that it's a very difficult environment to work in the oceans, to get data, to be able to effectively uh, manage our models and create uh, very accurate uh, model outputs and forecasts of where we're going in the, in the world's oceans. And uh, as an oceanographer that spends a lot of my time at sea, I appreciate just how much time is needed to do very simple single stations. Getting down to the sea floor, uh, in most cases, takes about six hours of your, of your research time just taking an instrument to the sea floor and back again. If you want to do extensive drilling, you want to do a lot of geological work, you're looking at hours and hours of your time in just getting one single sample. And it's a big ocean out there, and trying to sort of get a, a feel of uh, where the ocean is going is, is no mean feat. But I hope I've given sort of a, a good overview of how the oceans are changing and what, what is causing that change over time. So that's it. Sorry.